viewers are warned that the following program may contain images and voices of people who have passed away. Hello, I'm Miriam Korowa. Welcome to Message Stick. Today's program is the start of an exciting three-part series about Pompero, a remote coastal village on the western side of Cape York Peninsula in North Queensland. Message Stick producer Jeremy Geyer is originally from Cairns but now has close family connections to Pompero and is a convert to the community and its relaxed way of life. If you're keen on fishing or croc spotting like Jeremy, then you're in for a treat, as these programs take you on a real adventure. In today's episode, you'll get to meet some fanatical anglers and experience the spectacular lightning and downpours that typify tropical Queensland's wet season. We hope you enjoy Postcards from Pompero. I've travelled to some of the most beautiful places in Australia, but it wasn't until I came to Pomparau that I understood what heaven on earth was. 700 people live in this remote coastal village on the western side of Cape York in Australia's far north. It's a home for fishing and crocodiles and stories that are told from a long time ago. Welcome to my version of paradise, a place called Pomparau. I arrived in the middle of the wet season, the rainy months after Christmas, and met Donald William, the King of Pomparau. Donald knows a lot about this country because of his cultural schooling, the songs and stories he learnt as a boy. <laughs> There's so many wonderful songs and stories from this country. It was quite fitting that another storyteller, John Coleman, let us know about the lightning song. The song tells the centuries-old story of two brothers who discover lightning for the very first time. The song's also a warning for locals and visitors to take care when the wet season storms are brewing. <laughs> them to all for a look. Hey. Like that one day. Hey, it's the hot, no? Start coming. The lightning. Right, you know? Oh, look, I think we got them. And they've been happy. <laughs> they laugh, you know? They, you know, they're happy. They've been happy because they have 
they've been finding him in you know, the right place, right story place. That's where I, I don't track him there because it's a bit dangerous. That's why I, well, that's why I talk to these people when they go with the boat, you know, for fishing. Better not go near there. Keep away. <laughs> According to a time-honoured tradition, it's believed that once the lightning story has been told or sung, rain always follows. The torrential downpours carry a special meaning for this part of the world. It marks a new beginning, if you like, a rebirth for country. Rain can last for weeks, or sometimes just a minute, but no matter how long it lasts, life goes on. This heavenly reminder prompts the locals to head down to the beach for one of the most favourite and must-do Pomparau activities, fishing. Well, the fishing here um, is very good here. In uh, April, May, uh, February, March and April, that's the season for uh, barramundi, salmon, prawn, the mud crab, you name it. Oh, gee. There's one very special story about this place. Pomparau is said to be home to some of the most beautiful women in the world. So romance is also another hook that keeps visitors here longer. I'm Calvin Reynolds. I've been in Pompera for seven years now I'm with a local girl from here. And we do fishing every time we can get a chance to fish. Well, I moved up here doing station work out at Strathgordon. We built the new outstation, helped build the new outstation there. And coming to town, I met Christine and stayed here ever since. Well, I'm from Cairns, but I've been through Laura and I've been through a few other communities, and I just found Pompera as the, like, the best community for, like, fishing, hunting, and and it's the best social community. Like, they're really polite. The locals are always polite to you and really good community. To the many Pomperau hunters and anglers, the wet season is the best time to go fishing. Well, the wet season flushes all the fish and everything out and it just makes, fattens them all up and once you get a rush of fresh coming out, you get all your fish and then the prawns start, then your salmon start. It just is like a chain reaction, just keeps going. It's the best fishing time straight after the wet and through the wet. Everyone tells us how easy it is to get seafood here, but maybe this time the fish were just camera shy. One thing for sure, grabbing a quick fish bite is far easier for the other locals that share this part of the world, the saltwater crocodile. Despite the obvious dangers, Calvin Reynolds is yet to have an unpleasant experience with a croc, or a pleasurable one for that matter. They don't bother us too much. No, you, you watch for them, you watch for slide marks. You always look around, have a quick look for slide marks, but there's no slide marks around where you are and stuff like that. You just got to keep an eye out for them. Like when we go up the river, we sometimes walk through the little creeks and drag the little creeks. While catching fish can be an interesting waiting game, not so long ago, it was the best form of fast food takeaway in the country. But now locals say numbers are noticeably falling because of commercial fishing in the Gulf and large scale nets. But this is the too many net, fish net, you know? Spoil it then. You can see much now. You can see the stinger fish just floating around all over the bank. Right along. See black everywhere. But this day you can see it now. If you're not a great angler, then you'll end up here. It's the local store a key meeting place and an ideal one to seek shelter if there's a cyclone about. It's also the central business district for this small isolated community. My name's uh, Tom Marnie. I uh, 
came to Pompreau just on 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, currently I manage the store here for the uh, Queensland Government, which have, was one of six stores they have on the, on the Cape. Shark, salmon. Tom's tour of duty in Pomparau has been littered with remote community dramas. He's wrestled a rogue crocodile in the main street and saved the community from starvation when the old store burnt down. All this in his first month of service. We sat up, set up Saturday night and Monday and Tuesday morning when the truck arrived about 10.30 and uh, we had groceries on shelf by cartons cut away and everything else by four o'clock and we were back, back trading that night so uh, it, it was great and the whole community spirit, everyone, everyone helped in, carpenters, plumbers, uh, you know, people just coming and helping unpack, getting things out on shelves, it was, you know, it was a, a community effort. The hard part was uh, trying to remember all the prices <laughs> and working out of a, a, a cash tin rather than a, a, a cash register and a, a computerised system but, uh, but we got it pretty close to it. Yeah. You know, work here. You know, work on the till. I'm gonna press all the buttons. Oh, look, there it is. This show of community spirit prompted Tom to stay, and today he and his wife call Pomperau home. Describing Pomperau, I'd say it is the friendliest place I've, I've been in, whether it be mainstream or or communities. Uh, everyone speaks to each one, everyone's reasonably happy, even though the people here have a pretty tough lifestyle with the uh, financial issues they've got and the housing issues, everyone's reasonably happy all the time. Pompreau has been described as the, uh, the jewel of the Cape. Uh, it's quite a clean town. It's, uh, people take pride in their, uh, in their yards and the houses in a lot of cases. It's a beautiful spot on the beach. It's a river system north and south, so uh, we get some and then fantastic sunsets every night. Uh, just about there's a glorious sunset going down. As the rain tumbles, the conditions on the ground can get a little rough. In the wet, Pomperau becomes an isolated community as all land corridors turn into lagoons or slush ponds. This effectively turns the village into an island, where the only way to get in and out is by air and sea. When the locals see this plane, mouths water with anticipation as this sign from above brings milk, bread and other fresh food. But there are some things you need in the bush that can't be flown in. This mob are collecting cabbage palm, a useful plant for making bush products like dilly bags, fishing nets and grass skirts. Oh, we get a palm tree, we make grass skirt and make a dilly bag with that same one. And we watch them weaving, dry them up in the sun. And we, we get a bush dye, boil them with bucket. Stripping the cabbage palm is an art in itself. It can take Doris William hours just to make a small strand of string. Yeah. 
Just down the beach a little further, and I'm still trying to nail a big fish catch for our cameras. Even though he's out of luck, devoted angler Bert Edwards is always patient. He's also a keen bush chef who's willing to share a recipe or two. I like to keep my fish. I like to put it on the coal, turn it around or something like that. You, know, you can't only cook one side. <laughs> you got to turn it around and uh, both sides. And you put it on a leaf, break some leaf or something like that, and you put a salt on it. Peel the uh, skin off. Maybe Tabasco sauce, go with it, and uh, rice or bread, damper. You're gonna eat it then. You start making me hungry now. <laughs> In our quest for fish, we've decided to look to a higher source. This is the Anglican Church. It's one of the most prominent organisations in Pomparau. Pomparau was established as an Anglican mission just 70 years ago. A bloke by the name of Joseph Chapman was sent to spread the word of God and let the locals know that the Church of England and the Holy Father was boss. Cyril William still remembers the preacher Old Chappie as the first white man he ever saw in his life. First time old Chapman came here, he had to get the permission of my father and my auntie and my grandmother, my father's mother, to get here, otherwise they wouldn't let him come here. This was strict before. If no permission here, you know, years ago, He'll get hunted or he'll get spear. The first white man, or chappy, yeah. But he was only young then. He was here in 1930 something. Because that's the first white man I seen him. I've seen white men all my life, yeah. It's all the black who see here. And my mother was said, see that white fellow and I used to frighten from the color of him. Yeah. No, he's not our color. No, he's a, he's a white man. He came here. So he stay here for a while and give the people a bit of job, you know? Not a hard job, maybe just for work for Russian. Life in this pristine part of the world was extremely hard before the church arrived. Spear fighting was the best method to settle arguments and even a better way to start them. Even with God's presence, locals took to the spear over the cross to make things all even. I grew up here, but the schooling wasn't too good for us, for me and my brothers. So we had to go down to uh, Mitchell River School for better schooling down there. The reason why we went down there, it was a hostile country here. Our people just, you know, fight man with spears, what do you name it? They were bad mob back in those days. One of the missionaries was he, a bloke by the name of J.W. Chapman. He said, hey, I tell you what, he told my uncle Hector Jackson and uh, 
my father, Jimmy Jackson, he said, you better not keep them two boys here. And um, so we had to move. And uh, when we left school, me and my brother, we went out to our work on the cattle station. You know? When I was about 20, 23, 24, I came back home to Pompro. If you survived a spear attack today, this is where you'd end up. The Pomperau Clinic has a small team of nurses dedicated to keeping this community healthy. From flying doctor emergencies through to fishing accidents, these nurses have seen it all. The clinic is often busy, especially in the wet season. There's over 400 children here. Um, they uh, range in age from birth to 16. Um, the, their problems are mostly um, scabies, um, infected sores. This time of the year they all play in the puddles. So they're scratched mozzie bites, get infected very easily. We had a fellow come in with a fish hook in his head one day, um, through his cap, into his head, um, complete with bait, um, still on the hook. Um, that was interesting. Um, and, and you sort of had to find something to cut the hook so you could get the hat off, get the bait off, and then get the fish hook out. So that, that was a bit of a, um, a bit of a problem for him. It was different on both sides. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You put it up here, so that blood can get blocked from there. That's not right. Up there, not, not up Where here. Where do you want? Up up, oh, up here. Yeah, up here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yeah, OK. Right, just relax it. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Just relax. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Good. All finished. <laughs> yeah, all good. Okay. Right, right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the wet season offers a smorgasbord of tropical health challenges. While the rain can provide cool relief, it's also fuel to breed mosquitoes and the nasty viruses they carry. We have a health promotion officer who comes in every couple of weeks. She is in touch with the council, with the school, um, with HAC, uh, with all those outside agencies for that type of education. Staff, we, we make sure that they know at night time they should have long sleeves if they're outside, that they empty all uh, water receptacles and containers that are around the house. We can't do much about the puddles that are around and the, the water laying everywhere. But as long as they know that mosquitoes bring things like dengue and Ross River virus and flavor virus and all those other sorts of um, blood-borne things um, that can make you feel uh, very ill for quite some time. Disaster management in the wet season often has its challenges. Even with access to the Royal Flying Doctor, getting in and out of Pomperau in a medical crisis is never guaranteed. Through storms and uh, lightning, and we've got an, a plane coming in, RFDF plane, Royal Flying Doctor Service plane coming in, and they won't, they won't be able to land. They'll come so far, and um, yeah, if they can't land, they'll go back to Cairns. So um, virtually you could be at the airport waiting for them to land, and then you can just hear the plane go go off again and it's heading back to Cairns. Man's best friend also receives favourable treatment at the clinic, which sometimes becomes an animal rescue centre. We don't just work with the, uh, with the families and the communities here, we also work with a lot of animals. Um, families bring their dogs in here to be either sorted out from, you know, being attacked by pigs or you'll have dogs coming in with uh, fishing hooks or lures and that through their, you know, lips or noses or foots and stuff like that. So we have to try and address and, yeah, sort them out as well. We don't have no vet here. And with the amount of dogs in Pomperau, a pet surgeon would be a millionaire by now. Like most communities, dogs are very much part of the package. In fact, most homes would have more than one. For the local canines, the wet season is also their favourite part of the year. Bathing during the dry season will often result in a dog of the day catch for crocodiles. 
dogs reduce their chances of being snapped up in the wet season as most female crocs are busy nesting. Now, I did promise to get some fish action in this documentary series, and finally we found this mob at the Munkin River. A beachside fire and some tasty fish, and voila! Bush tucker on the beach. It doesn't get much better than this. Next week, join us as we spend some quality time up close and personal with those dinosaurs at the croc farm. Just how do these reptiles keep the unemployment monster away from Pomparau? Yo all, uppo, and see you next week. We hope you enjoyed the program. If you'd like to know more about Message Stick, please go to our website at abc.net.au slash message stick. We'll see you next week for more postcards from Pomperol. Balanda, we are.